It's good to see everyone this morning. If you're visiting with us, we want to welcome you and encourage you to come back and visit with us uh, at any opportunity that you might have. You know, the Bible is a book of life, and therefore it deals with issues that are true to life. You know, some books deal with fantasy. They deal with things that really don't occur or possibly never could occur, kind of like science fiction. But as I say, the Bible is a book of life, and the, and the issues that it deals with are very true. And, and as you study the Word of God, and I don't mean just peruse it, reading occasionally, but when you really delve into God's Word and you study, you'll find that it deals with our problems from a very real perspective. It does not deny the problems we face. It doesn't just you know, kind of sweep them under the rug. The Bible is very forthright. As far as the things that we have to go through, the things that we deal with as, as human beings. And we also find that the Bible offers solutions to every problem that we face. Now that's not to say that we always like that solution or that answer. It's not to say that everyone is going to follow the advice of Scripture when it comes to dealing with problems. But yet, God's answers are not only very practicable, they're very workable when they are applied, when they are followed. And I suppose one of the greatest problems, and I think everyone would agree with this, but, but one of the greatest problems that we as human beings have to face is sorrow and grief. Sorrow and grief are issues that every one of us must face. Now there are some problems in life that are peculiar to women. There are some problems in life that are peculiar to men. And, and there are problems peculiar to age or perhaps ethnicity. But yet the problems of sorrow and the problems of grief affect everyone. Young and old, male and female. And I dare say that every adult in this audience has at some point in their life had to deal with sorrow and grief. And if not, count yourself very fortunate. But the day will come when you have to face sorrow, when you have to deal with grief. And for this reason, we need to learn how to deal with these things. We look about, we see people reacting to grief and sorrow in all kinds of ways. Some people turn to alcohol and, and some people turn to drugs and others turn their back on God. They react differently when they face these difficult times. But you know, there are two very good reasons for learning how to deal with sorrow. First of all, we've already mentioned the fact that no one is immune to it. We all are going to face it sooner or later. And secondly, sorrow and grief can produce a crisis in our life that's going to affect us, not just in the short term, but perhaps long term, possibly even reaching into eternity. And how we deal with these sorrows in life, how we deal with these problems in life, may well affect our eternal destiny. You know, there are all kinds of books. You can go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon, wherever you buy your books, and, and you can look in the help section and you'll find that there are literally hundreds of books uh, dealing with how to handle bereavement how to deal with grief, how to face sorrow, and there are all kinds of opinions you'll find from men on how to deal with them. And yet I would suggest to you this morning that the Word of God is the only book that we need. It has the answer if we will take the time to look for it and to apply it. And I would suggest to you that one of the reasons we have been given the book of Ruth in the Old Testament is because it is an example of how to deal with grief and sorrow. The book of Ruth is one of the most beautiful stories in all of the Old Testament. Someone has suggested it's one of the most popular books because it deals with two of uh, our most common themes in life. It deals with love and it deals with sorrow. And, and the passage that was read for us a few moments ago there in chapter 1, the opening five verses, basically we find that a man and his wife and two sons went down to the land of Moab because there was a famine. They were searching for food, perhaps survival. And while they were there, this man died. Sometime later, his two sons died. And so we have his widow Naomi not only having to deal with going to a strange land and trying to provide sustenance for herself and for her family, now she is a widow. She has lost both of her sons. And I suppose there's nothing any more trying 
than a widow who is left destitute, for lack of a better term. There was no social security. There were no food stamps. There were no social programs that she could turn to. And the people of Moab were not necessarily known for their humanity and their generosity to strangers. Widows were pretty much left to fend for themselves. And as I say, in addition to the fact she lost her husband, she lost both of her sons. Now, we're not told exactly how close together these tragedies occurred, but, but yet here was a woman not only bereft of her husband, a provider, but in that day, children would look after their aged parents, especially the widowed mother. And so not only has she lost her husband as a breadwinner, but she has lost the future care that these two sons would have probably provided for her in times of need. Picture her a woman, alone, for all intents and purposes, in the land of Moab, a stranger, a widow, and seemingly with nothing in the way of money. Naomi is not so different from many today. In many a home today, some lonely Naomi is sitting by herself. Her children perhaps living a long way off or possibly close by, but just don't bother to come by. And she can remember the time when the house was filled with laughter. She can remember the time when she and her husband did things together and the children were at home and they would play. She remembers all of these good times and as she walks from room to room in the house, she can hear the echoes of the voices, the laughter, the good times that were there, but they're gone. She's alone. And that's how I picture Naomi here. What does she do? How does she deal with the sorrow that life has dealt her? I don't pretend to have all of the answers, and I certainly don't think that what I'm going to say this morning exhausts what this book has to offer. But I want to talk about overcoming sorrow, and I want to begin by looking at these three women. First of all, notice Orpah. And if you have your Bibles, just turn to the book of Ruth. <clears throat> Remember, Orpah is one of Naomi's daughter-in-laws. She made a choice because her mother-in-law said, well, I'm going back home. She'd heard there was food in the land. In fact, notice verses 14 and 15. Uh, notice the choice she makes to stay behind. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back into her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So Naomi has told her daughter-in-laws, Look, I'm going back to the land of my forefathers. I'm going back to my homeland. You two go back to your parents. Stay at home. And we find the reaction of these two women totally different. On the one hand, Ruth does not want to go back. Orpah says basically, okay, I'm, I'm going to go back. And, and so it was very easy for her to go back. It didn't solve the problem that Orpah was facing. Remember, she's lost a husband too. But you see, she's going back to godless Moab where there'll be no comfort. No one could help her there. Not the kind of help that she needed. And so it is today, a lot of people in the world and even in the church look to the wrong places. They look to the wrong source to find comfort. They don't turn to God. They don't turn to their spiritual family. They turn to the world, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whatever, pleasure, but they don't find the comfort that they need. And there are a lot of places like that. And, and again, Orpah was not the first or the last to look to the wrong place to deal with the grief that she was facing. But let's move on. We don't have a lot of information. This kind of, we're introduced to her and she fades away. We know nothing else about Orpah at this point. Did she remarry? How long did she live? What happened? Nothing. We're not told. But move on and let's consider Naomi. Notice how Naomi deals with her sorrow. You know, as keenly as she feels the loss of her husband and her two sons, here is a woman who refuses to be mastered by her sorrow. She's not going to be overcome. And she begins by facing it head on. She doesn't deny it. Notice what she says, though, when she gets back home. She, she acknowledges her grief. You know, you can imagine she's come home. We're not told how long she's been away, but people are saying, look, there's Naomi. Isn't that Naomi coming home? 
And notice her response to these people in verse 20. And actually, we could read verse 21 as well. But she tells them, don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara. In other words, she gives herself a name that expresses her grief and her sorrow and her loss. She says, no, don't, don't call me Naomi anymore. So she doesn't close her eyes to the reality of, of what she's going through. She admits it. Unlike a lot of people today, they, they want to bury their heads in the sand. They want to deny what's happened, and, and they don't want to face it. And day to day, they have a hard time dealing with it. But I'm going to tell you something. Denying grief doesn't make it any easier to deal with. To deny that something has happened in our life, whether it's a personal illness, whether it's the loss of a loved one, or whatever it may be, does not make it any easier to bear. But as we look at her, here's a woman, she doesn't brood over her sorrow. She doesn't go off on a tangent, we might say. She doesn't try to run from her sorrow. You remember Paul Harvey used to say, years ago, you can run, but you can't hide. And that's the way it is with sorrow. We can try to escape it, but it's still there. It's going to follow us. And she doesn't let her sad experience make her bitter. Some people become bitter. You know, they lose a child, they lose a spouse, they lose something very near and dear, and, and they turn their back on others. They even turn their back on God sometimes. They become so eaten up with bitterness. But she doesn't try to place the blame for what's happened on somebody else. How easy it would hurt to have been to say, well, if Elimelech had stayed home, this might not have happened. If we hadn't moved down here to Moab, maybe my husband would be alive today, and maybe my sons would be alive. No, she doesn't try to place the blame on anyone else. She knows she can't undo what's happened. And so she faces it. And above all, she doesn't blame God. More than once, I've had people, grieving people, say to me, why did God take my, and then you fill in the blank, whether it's child, husband, wife, parent, sister, brother, whatever. Why did God do this? Of course, the answer is God didn't do it. Death is a part of our human existence. Death came into the world with sin, and man brought sin in when he disobeyed God. And in so doing, brought death into the world. But here's a woman who used a sorrow to strengthen her faith. She used her sorrow to make her faith stronger. She doesn't let it weaken her. And, and so it is when we face sorrow and grief in our life, it can either make us stronger, it can make us weaker, it can build us up, it can tear us down. And so the question is, how are we going to face sorrow and grief? Will it strengthen us? Will it weaken us? And here was a woman who let her sorrow and grief strengthen her faith in God. Notice verses 6 and 7 there of chapter 1. She arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. In other words, the famine is over back in her homeland. Verse 7, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now she had two choices, basically. She could stay in the land of Moab or she could return back to Judah where God was. She could return to God's land. And that's what she decides to do. When we face sorrow, where do we turn? Do we turn back to God? Or do we turn to the world? She's a good example of what we ought to do. And certainly when we face hard times in our life, that ought to make us closer to the church, to our church family. It ought to make us closer to God. It ought to draw us to God's Word. It ought to make us stronger in our prayer life. Because all of these have the ability to strengthen us, to give us the strength that we need. Naomi was clearly a woman who believed that God was going to work things out. God was going to take care of things as we see in chapter 3. But now let's look at Ruth. And Ruth is kind of the central character uh, throughout this book. And notice how she overcame her sorrow. Unlike her sister-in-law, Orpah, she didn't take the easy way out. She could have said, well, I'm going to go back home to my parents, and, and you know, maybe I can find another husband. I'm still a young woman. I'm still marrying age, and so I'm just going to go home. No, she doesn't do that. She doesn't look behind her and talk about what she's lost or what's happened to her, but, but she looks ahead. 
she knows she can't change what's happened. And so she decides to forge ahead. And, and notice verses 16 through 18. After her mother-in-law tells both daughter-in-laws to go back home to your parents, notice her response. And, and you've heard this read at weddings many, many times. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God, whether thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part between thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Her mother-in-law realized she wasn't going to change her mind. That Ruth was committed to going back with her. What was left in Moab for her? Yes, she had friends, perhaps family, she had many memories, but that was it. On the other hand, she faces Israel, a, a land that as far as we know she's never visited, she doesn't know anyone, a land of, of strangers. And she has a decision to make. She can go back to familiar territory, to people she knows, or, or she can follow her mother-in-law to a new place. And you know the solution she chose to go with her, to be there for moral support, and of course we're going to see financial support, and when I say financial, I'm talking about the food that she helped procure for herself and her mother-in-law. Ruth doesn't grumble about how hard her lot in life was. She simply makes the best of it. We don't hear her complaining as we read the book of Ruth about, oh, my poor hands, look at them gleaning grain all day for just enough food to eat. If she complained, it's not recorded. And so she turns back to Israel with her mother-in-law for moral support, for lack of a better term, to share her sorrow. And that's one of the ways that we can deal with sorrow. One of the best cures for grief is to help others deal with their grief. We've all known people who in times of sorrow, what do they do? They lock themselves away, they go to bed, and. They don't want to see anyone. They don't want to be around people. And they wallow, if you will, in their grief. On the other hand, there are those who have lost loved ones. And what do they do? They turn to others to help them in their time of grief and sorrow. And I'm going to tell you, that's one of the best cures for sorrow, is to help someone carry their load. But you know, Ruth found comfort in God's people. Those words that she spoke that we read a moment ago in verse 16, she said, Thy people shall be my people. How little did she realize? She couldn't have known how true those words are going to be because, as you know, she goes back and she marries a man by the name of Boaz who was a kinsman of her deceased husband. The end of the story shows how much she gained. Yes, she lost a lot. She lost her homeland. She lost her husband. She lost her father-in-law. But as the story comes to a close, she is blessed enormously. Not only does she have security, she no longer has to glean in the fields because her husband's a very prosperous farmer, but she becomes part of the lineage of the Messiah to come. Her name being recorded in Scripture. Notice verses 17 through 22 of chapter uh, 4 there. And this is after she's married to, to Boaz. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, talking about the child born to Ruth and Boaz. There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, and he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez beget Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. And these same words are recorded in the first chapter of Matthew, the genealogy there uh, in verse 5, speaking of uh, there. And Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz, and Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Think about it. She was the grandmother of David, the second king of Israel. And so here's a woman who doesn't sit by eaten up with grief and filled with self-pity. What does she do? She gets back to Israel and the first thing she says, what can I do? She says, let 
me glean. And you've got to understand that when the farmers would, would harvest their crops, God had instructed them, don't, don't glean the corners of the field. And if you spill some grain on the ground, don't get down there and scoop it up. Leave it for the poor. Leave it for the widows. And so you had people who would follow the, the, the gleaners, the people who harvested the crops. They would follow them through the fields and they would try to find enough that was spilled or left in the corners that they could go home and have enough for that day's food. Think about going day after day, week after week, for several months, because the harvest in Israel lasted for several months, depending on the grains that were being grown. Getting just enough food to exist. And yet, we don't read of her complaining. She went to work. But you know the rest of the story. In the end... Ruth finds comfort through redemption. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4, we're told that Boaz went up to the gate and sat down. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spoke came by, and to whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that has come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, The day that thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. This was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redemption. Now I'm going to stop reading there. You've got to understand, under the Leverite law, when a woman was left a widow... The next of kin was to marry her, to raise up seed, to continue the family name to his departed brother or next of kin. And so Boaz goes to the next of kin. There was one relative closer than he was. And he gave him the opportunity, look, and, and also in, in marrying that widow, they obtained the property, any property that would have belonged to the deceased man. And so the first man realizes, well, if I, if I buy this property off Naomi, I, I'm also going to have to marry this woman Ruth. And he says, well, no, I can't do that. So now Boaz is given a green light, if you will, to marry Boaz. To redeem her was the term that was used, to redeem her. And so she was redeemed by Boaz according to the Leverite law. And, of course, today we, in our sorrow, can be redeemed through Christ. Not the Leverite law, not a literal marriage, but when we become Christians, we do become married to Christ. He is the great bridegroom. And so as Christians, we have been bought by Christ. Acts 20 and verse 28, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. In fact, Peter says, For as much as you know as you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain manner of life, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. Think about it. When Ruth was redeemed by Boaz, she no longer had to work in the fields all day gathering enough grain to get them by for a day or two. No longer was she considered a poor outcast, but now she is the bride of Boaz, a man who seemingly was well-known, a man who was respected in the gates of the city. She was cared for. She was provided for. And likewise, when we obey the gospel, we are redeemed by Christ. We are a part of that royal family. We are children of God. And God has promised to provide for us. In closing, I would remind you that sorrow is not of God. Because sin is not of God. But God has the answer. God not only has the answer to sorrow, but he has the answer for sin. And, and actually the answer is the same. The answer for sorrow and sin. And I would suggest that we study the book of Ruth in, in greater detail because it tells us so much about how to deal with, with sorrow. And, and certainly these women knew what sorrow was all about. 
But at the same time, I would hasten to add that if you're not in Christ, there is no comfort. No true and lasting comfort. Because it's only in Christ, only in the gospel, that we can find the comfort that we need in, in times of loss such as this. We're going to close our lesson this morning extending the invitation of Christ. If, if you've never yet obeyed the gospel, you can do so this morning. Coming in faith, repenting, and turning from your sins, confessing the name of Christ, that, that he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and let him add you to his body, the church. And then you have the access to all of these blessings of redemption that we've been talking about this morning. If you need to respond to this invitation of Christ, why not come while together we stand and we sing?